this is uh, the second season of our TV show, uh, which <laughs> is a TV show lectures by Jean-Michel. And uh, in a way, uh, this second season is going to simply be the continuation of uh, uh, the first season, which was given in 2022. Uh, but I'm, I, my hope is that I transition from philosophy of mathematics uh, to a short presentation of my personal philosophy, which I call ethoanalysis. And I will present it under the prism of philosophy of culture. Uh, so that it was the way. In my, but I feel more authorized to do so after having heard Eric Schlisser's plea for a synthetic philosophy. Uh, as I understood him, uh, he wanted to uh, propose synthetic philosophy as a new philosophical framework for philosophy of science, more hospitable to a large variety of approaches. So you remember in some of his slides, we saw a lot of things which could enter his synthetic philosophy. Uh, so uh, as I see it, philosophy of science uh, presupposes the distinction between philosophy and science. There can be philosophy of science only because there is Uh, located at different places. Uh, philosophy. Yeah, so uh, I should speak louder. You, you want? Yeah, okay. Uh, so, you need I, two mouths. You, want, you need a mouth going this way. And a mouth yeah. going. Or maybe you need your ear okay. right there. Mm -hmm. I, I change. I hope. <laughs> Might be easier. <laughs> So, uh, traditionally, uh, philosophy of science names an effort for commenting, discussing, or even in the, in, in the most ambitious uh, uh, guise, reconceptualizing at some level science and its, res uh, its results. Uh, but that happens uh, with an external gaze. That's the, I, I feel, as I understand it, it's, that's the general idea of philosophy of science. So if, if we agree with that, it means that uh, philosophy of science uh, cannot be unaware of the fact that uh, there are several regions of culture. Uh, because as such, philosophy of science deals with philosophy and science, which are already two regions of culture. So, so uh, philosophy of science maybe should include a philosophical understanding of such heterogeneity. And uh, you, you remember that uh, uh, when I discussed Eric Schlisser's talk, uh, I told him that uh, what he was really dealing with was not division of labor, but heterogeneity of culture. Uh, and a philosophical understanding of heterog heterogeneity of culture, this is exactly uh, uh, classical analytic philosophy has a tendency to look down to philosophy of science, to say that philosophy of science is often less rigorous than pure analytic philosophy. And uh, I, I think that uh, the good framework for avoiding that, for avoiding pure philosophers to look down to uh, philosophy of science is philosophy of culture. Uh, and I, I would add a remark that uh, we already need such framework, the, the, fr the framework of philosophy of culture, <coughs> simply to ask the question of the conference we just had uh, is philosophy useful for science and vice versa? Vice versa. It's, it's a question which asks whether two regions of culture may be of some uh, interest for one for each other. 
so that's the reason why after uh, keeping on presenting conceptions uh, belonging to philosophy of mathematics, I would like to address the issue of philosophy of culture. So uh, what I will do uh, in the second part of this uh, seminar uh, is that I, I plan to discuss the definition of uh, philosophy of culture because it can be understood in uh, many ways and it has been understood in many ways, most often not like I would prefer to understand it. Uh, so I would like to uh, offer you a brief and partial story of how philosophy of culture has existed in the past. And, uh, and then I, uh, I want to present you my ethical analysis as a new philosophy of culture. And I, I, I will try to compare it with previous forms. Uh, but uh, also, I should add that uh, uh, my, 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 I would like to come back to the first part of the seminar dealing with philosophy of mathematics and, uh, re, and in a way include it in philosophy of culture. That, that it would be the last thing uh, uh, that I intend to do, uh, even if I'm not sure I will have time enough for doing all that. Okay. Can you can as a introduction to me? Well, so for the moment, I only completely see... without any sort of possibility. Yeah. So I I will, for the moment yeah. I only said one thing is that it's a philosophical understanding of the heterogeneity of culture, and that 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 would be my way of seeing it. But then. I, I'm okay, going to tell the story that how people thinker, have defined it, which which is other thinker, uh, uh, one way to understand the way which mathematics interact. For example, each question of interaction of mathematics with something else is okay. as such a part of philosophy of now, culture as I see it. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, now, now I'm going to uh, begin with the first part, which will be, which will be the philosophy of mathematics part. And uh, I want to, I think it's only fair that I first remind you uh, what I told in 2022, quickly. 2022? Yes. I thought it was no, 2022. 2022, uh, uh, there's a uh, winter term. So it's more than one year ago. Because you, 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 you had another winter term, so yeah, it's one know. and a half here. Okay, we missed you. Thank you so much. <laughs> I missed you too, but I saw... Uh, so it depends if we I saw, apply... She didn't miss Marco. He didn't miss Marco. Standard <laughs> <laughs> Yes, okay. <laughs> Let's keep with the standard I saw the room and uh, some of... Uh, and the people of the youth <laughs> seminar to talk. Mm -hmm. so. Okay. So, uh, sorry, I, I'm too far. Yes, so it, uh, I started by presenting the French context of my work. So I uh, first expounded uh, Jules, Jules Vuillemin's philosophy of mathematics. Uh, and uh, as, as a, a good example of this context of my work, and then I went on characterizing French neo-Kantianism, of which Vuma was uh, understood to be a very good uh, case. That was the first part, uh, which was on Vuma and neo-Kantianism. And then I described uh, my, form, my formal hermeneutics, which is the title of my 1991-2013 book. And I tried to show that uh, formal hermeneutics was a way of taking up the new French neo-Kantianism, but also a way of parting from it. Uh, my formal hermeneutics was also a rejection of French neo-Kantianism. Uh, then I addressed the question, what is philosophy of mathematics? 
I briefly uh, looked at how Stu Stuart Sh Shapiro uh, seems to understand the issue. And then I gave my personal approach of uh, an, answer, an answer to the question, what is philosophy of mathematics? And this answer is grounded in a specific understanding of the relation between philosophy and mathematics. And I, I, I read you quotations of uh, Shapiro in which Shapiro himself was seeing any possible definition of philosophy of mathematics as grounded in a conception of the relation between philosophy and mathematics. Sorry. Uh, so in my approach, philosophy is the attempt as extending the universal classifying attitude of mathematics from the area of the object to the area of the thing. Uh, so such conception is simply dictated by our Platonician inheritance. I, I think I, I don't say much more than what Plato said. Uh, Plato starts with a recognition that mathematics does a great job because mathematics offers interesting categorizations of an infinite range of objects. Uh, that's exactly what Plato does uh, in the uh, Theaetetus when he comments on uh, Theodorus' work. And uh, then the next step is that we have to, uh, according to me, we have to acknowledge that uh, such mathematical gesture of uh, Classifying an infinite range of objects, it, it cannot be, uh, it cannot work in, in the mathematical way. Such mathematical gesture cannot work with any kind of material. Uh, we have to recognize the distinction between objects and entities which can be treated as logical points and entities with respect to which any such machinery seems abusive. So, can you say that again? Can you go back so I can read that yeah. last sentence? Okay, sorry. No, no. So the idea is, I remember something my father was always saying. Uh, he was teaching mathematics and he said, when you do mathematics, you know that mathematics do, do not work everywhere all the time. When you say that there are entities that cannot be traded to the point, that are entities that we can distinguish from another one, but not among them. So to say that they are not saying analytical language, they are not objects that fall under sort of concepts. So I, I remember that in 2022, you asked this question. <laughs> you asked, the, and now I, I think that I know more, I understand you more, because I understand more what a sort of concept is. And I think so the, the notion of sort of concept is uh, an, an analytic version of being of being in Heidegger. Uh, being of being. Yes, you know, being with great B of being. Of being. So uh, being with great B, it's simply the idea. Of we have to understand the, the verb being in a general way. So that when we say that something is, there is some meaning which is conveyed by the is part of our sentence. And so uh, I think that uh, I already saw that in, uh, in Quine, for example, that uh, Quine says that when we say that such, such, such kind of things exist, we mean that we are able to define identity and difference between them. So it's, that's a, they, they come under a sort of concept. So can, it, it would be it would be their version, an analytic version of being of being in Heideggerian language. But then my idea of uh, the, the of uh, object versus thing is a bit different because I think that in Quine's approach, uh, the very idea that there are things which are not object is almost impossible. Yes, but then we do not need them to explain them to the survey here. Concepts that identify entities that we can have an identification of. So tables for example, is the case. And then we can also imagine that we can conscious 
we can speak of memory or we can speak of feelings. And feelings are not the things that we are the clear condition of the entity of, even if, of course, we know what they are in some sense. So my question is now, for you think uh, entities like feeling? I uh, I'm, will, going, uh, I'm going that they do not have, we know what they are, but we do not have a clear distinction. Between I, them. I'm, I'm going to give a reminder of that. But I think that, uh, you know, it's, it's the distinction between objects. It's not a distinction between concepts. So the notion of social concept is made to distinguish some concepts from other concepts. So I think it's different in that sense. So now you do not answer me. You did not answer the time. Well, he says he just you told go. you that he's going to explain in the next slide. Yeah, Can yeah. you wait well, for then, a little bit? Then. So uh, I call the first uh, the, the entities with which uh, using the mathematic, ma mathematical machinery doesn't seem to raise any problem. I call them objects. So uh, and re rebellious entities, I call things. <laughs> or, or, uh, or I could say differently. I could say that things is the larger box containing also objects. I think it's 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 likely to say that way. And uh, yes, yeah, so boxes are not rebellious. I don't understand. <laughs> now I now I don't understand. There is a For example. Uh, the ring of the integers is an object. The, the what? The ring of the integer. The ring of? Of the integer numbers. Is that a uh, an the, uh, Z as the ring of integer numbers. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. No, uh, yes, it's, well, it would be an object, yes. Anything, uh, when we have the ZFC presentation of mathematical objects, uh, they are objects because they are uh, they are taken care of by a first order theory, which means that they are, they may function as logical points. To the distinction kind of the theory that you are I said objects they they may uh, they, they may be treated as logical points. Not only uh, I, I think. If you have to operate classification with a large range of objects, whether these objects are logical points or not is very important. You don't have the same operations for classifying. So is object and logic point the same? Well, in the first approach, yes. But uh, well, we do not understand then, the logical point. Then, no, no, then, no, then, logical then, point, I thought, was minor in terms of the logic. So it's definable by logic. No, it's, a, it's it's logical discourse. But I'm I'm going to say a bit more, not not much more, but a bit more in the next paragraph. So please allow me to go on. Uh, so I, I I remind you that uh, my terminology is inspired by Shakespeare, and I have in mind Hamlet, Hamlet's famous sentence: "There are more things under heaven and earth, Horatio, than are dreamt in your philosophy." So. Uh, it means that, uh, and he's, he, he wants to say that uh, the specter spect uh, is, is not an ordinary thing, but we have to, you have to deal with the specter. It is, a, 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 sorry, it is not so simple, because of course, I should not only share, uh, share the rest of the lot of more things in my philosophy. The problem here is not a set of other things. The problem here is that you name them. Uh, you have the impression that you are able to identify them, even if they are not by the So there are some skies that are not the right theology, but still I can speak yeah. of them. And this is the problem. How can you speak of them if they are not your philosophy? Yeah. This is my question. No, well, uh, Horatio wants his inter uh, uh, no, Hamlet wants Horatio to accept that he is going to speak about the spectrum. And uh, for he begins by uh, telling him that there are more things than he's ready to accept. Uh, so that's that's why I, I, I like the quotation. And, okay. uh, and, and a lot of people commented that philosophy here means science or knowledge. Uh, the ghost is a thing, but not an object. Who? The ghost. The, 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 
uh, that's in, in Hamlet's uh, version, yes. Yeah. But uh, then uh, I elaborated on this, this distinction and I tried to uh, say something more about why certain things that we name uh, can, will not be objects. And uh, my, the, the best way of uh, describing that is to say that uh, things which are not objects are so because we cannot detach them easily from a certain context. So they are, we can name them and evoke them and they, they, they play some part in our discourse. But at the same time, we know very well that each time we mention them, we are brought back to their context. And so uh, I gave the example of uh, four kinds of things, phenomenal things. These are things which are not detachable from our consciousness. Uh, linguistic things, that's things which are not detachable from our discourse. Temporal things, uh, these are things which are not detachable from our pre-understanding of time. <laughs> and social things, uh, which are things which are not detachable from uh, whatever uh, we uh, are, what, whatever we have in common, whatever we live, we all are uh, swimming inside. So that's the social the, le the social level, and with the well known dispute about the social level, uh, for example, in soci classical sociology, you have the, the Durkheimian point of view where social things are ordinary things, they are part of the ontology, and uh, Weber, rather, with his methodological individualism, thought that uh, social things are, uh, do not really exist. Uh, what exists are individuals, and everything we say about social things may be brought back, may be reformulated at the level of individuals. So uh, that would be the the general approach of things. Uh, and then what, how do I understand philosophy of mathematics? So if you follow me up to this point, there is an issue about uh, uh, the border between objects and things, because philosophy tries to do the same as what we do in mathematics, universal classification, but it tries to do it with things and not with objects. So, uh, uh, how the exercise of philosophy is strongly connected with this border between uh, objects and things. And I define philosophy of mathematics as this way of philosophizing where we address the issue of the identity of mathematics while reflecting on the border between object and thing. So I think every philosophy has to reflect on the border between object and thing because it's part of the original position of philosophy as such. But uh, you, you don't always address the issue of the identity of mathematics while doing that, while reflecting on the border between object and thing. I have a question. Yeah. Maybe this goes into something you're about to get into, but this idea of something being detachable or non detachable. So an object is something that's detachable. But my question is what is it to detach it? it is that the exercise of kind of making it a logical point or understanding it to be a logical point? Is it an exercise in conceptualizing it and understanding it as a complete thing? What is it to detach something? Yeah, I, here I have two approaches. First, uh, an object is a logical point, and yeah. then uh, what makes things uh, uh, resistant to okay. being an object is that they are not detachable. And then I, can, I would comment in all your, the ways you, you just used, because when, when, when we are facing a thing which uh, we experience as not, not detachable, uh, we, we have the feeling that we cannot conceptualize it as detachable. We cannot deal with it intellectually uh, as detachable. Getting it, I mean, so one further question and then I'll stop. But mm -hmm. is this an epistemological claim about our limits? Or is it a metaphysical claim? Like the thing can't be detached because it's so much embedded in and informed by and is what it is yeah. because of the context. So I, I... Or are you just kind of agnostic about that distinction here? No, I, 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 
I don't like the metaphysical approach in general. So I would. I mean, but you mentioned Plato. So. Uh, no. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't understand Plato in a metaphysical way. Okay. Fair enough. No, no, no that's not that's right. I, I, for me, idealism was never part. Was ne never a normal part of uh, okay. metaphysics. Okay. But uh, I, uh, and people have made it metaphysical. Mm -hmm. Already, Plato makes it metaphysical. Right. Because he claims that ideas are the source of everything. Right. So in this way, he, he, he's doing metaphysics. But I, I, my understanding of Plato, I, I prefer the, the, the part of Plato, which is not immediately metaphysical. Okay, well, okay. But then, you're doing but, this neo-Kantian thing. Is that part of it? You're doing no, a neo-Kantian? No, I, no I, then I, I, I try to answer you more seriously. I think that in my description, it looks like epistemology. Because okay. I, what I described that when we are facing things, we acknowledge that we cannot deal with them gotcha. uh, in, in, in an intellectual logical way, uh, because they are not detachable. Uh, but then, uh, is there something uh, essential behind this inability of us? I don't know, and I don't okay. feel that I have to explain that. Because I think, you know, I'm, I'm still in the situation of Hamlet speaking with Horatio. So he wants simply his interlocutor to accept that uh, the ghost is also part of the discussion. Okay. And he, he's, he's not going to give, give a first order theory of ghosts, but he wants still the uh, Horatio to discuss with him about the ghost. So I think I, I'm in, in the same situation. I, I want people to accept to. Uh, consider things. Uh, so I explained the situation where we encounter something which is not detachable, and for that reason, we we have the feeling that we we we, not, we would not be fair when dealing in a logical way. It's more methodological, perhaps, right? The undetachability, as yeah, I see, yeah, is yeah. a certain but, exactly. I mean, it isn't detachable in the sense that you it's not by defining an object in a certain setting according to certain relations that then you have this precise criteria of identification, right? To talk. Yeah. And my impression is that when you say something is undetachable, uh, but this all sorts of things that you gave us examples of. Is exactly because in dealing with them um, conceptually, even though we are dealing with them conceptually, is not in a precise, logical, mathematical way, formal way that would allow things to be logical. Point. So that is not not metaphysical or epistemological. It's methodological in terms of the kind of investigation that you are able to do for dealing with things and objects. And in the sense, it is clear that mathematics is about logic, mathematics, computer science, whatever you do that is formal and symbolical will be related with objects. I think for me, it's not the issue of formalism because anyway, for example, Plato's example with Theatetus is- Well, it depends on how simply, you understand formal uh, then, yes. They, have, uh, they are dealing with natural numbers. I'm on your and, side here, I'm defending. No, no, and I, I, I understand like, it, but or then I, 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 it a lot of people would say that methodological is part of the system. Uh, I, I, I don't resist that. I think the issue is that I want that pragmatically we are going to discuss about yeah. other things than the, than the one who are entering a, a logical framework. Okay. Yeah. Are you, are you going to give an example of something that is a thing, but not an object? So I, 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 in 2022, I gave some examples. Uh, I, I gave, I, I, but there are, there are also, so I, 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 give, I, give, I give you another example, which is part of an, an, another talk in a way, uh, which is, uh, uh, I come back to uh, Nelson's Reformalization uh, of the non standard effect. And, and Nelson, he does that by uh, creating a new theory, IST, which is a super theory of ZFC, but you add only one predicate, one one plus predicate, which is ST, standard. So, standard in Robinson was a function. Uh, it, you have the standard part of something. And in Nelson, it's going to be a property 
some objects are standards and others are not. And so uh, then uh, Nelson says that in IST, all the axioms of ZFC and all axiom schemes are kept. So in a way, ZFC is still absolutely true. Uh, only the axiom schemes have to deal with formulas where ST, the new predicate, doesn't enter the internal formulas. And then he gives three new axiom schemes, I, S, and T, idealization, standardization, and transfer, which are governing the, the, the new grammar, including the ST property. And uh, then if you, if you look at his axioms, and if you try to make things coherent and to prove theorems, you understand very quickly that ST must not be definable in the language of ZFC because if it was, it would lead us to paradoxes. So here you have an example of a, a quality which is uh, not reducible to a previous uh, formal framework. So it's, it's not exactly the same thing, but uh, it gives you an idea that... Uh, uh, so I, I gave examples, for, for example, I can take the example of Marco, feelings are not detachable from consciousness, for example. Uh, so, if I have a theory of feelings which only treats, which tries to classify on uh, feelings uh, on a purely logical basis, I, 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 maybe it's, it, it doesn't, it, it, it's not fair. So, uh, is, is it consistent? You have to speak up. That I, yeah, that I think so that it's not conformable. Sort of concept. So we can know what they are, but we can know why they are distinguished from them. Yeah. What yeah. make feelings more tradable in the way? That I, I know I can say I am the feeling, I say Brenner the feeling, but I'm not able to answer whether the feeling of Brenner is the same than me. And mine. Yeah. This is my point. Yeah, so no, your your suggestion is that what I call a thing could be anything which doesn't enter under any sort of concept. Exactly. So, uh, yeah, maybe it's a way because uh, uh, if I use my uh, understanding of sort of concept for a standard analytic philosopher, it means that it doesn't exist. Because to exist is okay, to, is to come I under. I not a standard. Yeah, I know. I, I agree. So, feeling exists, of course, it exists. No, like no, I think yeah. you, and, and you, you can say that. Uh, <laughs> the, the, the old paradox about the uh, physios boat uh, is oh, yeah. also an example of a, something which fails to be a normal object uh, because it is undetachable from a social context. Theseus' ship with the rebuilding of all the planes. Ah, okay, okay, okay. So you, you, you can, and well, well, for example, uh, in, uh, in Putnam, uh, after some time, he says that uh, we cannot frame in a logical way the reference relation uh, in, in, in his book, Repre Representation and Reality. So, so in a, a way of saying that is that for him, the reference relation appears to as, as a thing in my language. That's a well, that's one. You, Choose the, your, your best example, depending on, on uh, what you are uh, acquainted with. So uh, I claimed that uh, people have done that, addressing the issue of the identity of mathematics while reflecting on the border between object and thing by focusing on five traditional questions. So I remind you these five questions. These are the questions which summarize, in my view, uh, the agenda of philosophy of mathematics. The question about the mathematical object, which is usually described as the question about the status of the mathematical object. Question about the respective status of philosophy and mathematics. So the question about the respective status of logic and mathematics. The question of mathematical historicity, which is almost... Uh, Broadly, uh, roughly speaking, it's the question of uh, how is it possible that while mathematics is staging 
internal things, still it has a history. And the question about mathematical geography, because one could have also the feeling that because mathematical mathematics deals with entities which are uh, detachable and uh, uh, likely to be logicalized, there should be only one kind of mathematical uh, entity. Uh, we should not have branches. But from the very beginning, we know that already in Plato, we have arithmetics versus geometry. Geometry, And I uh, explained that uh, now the situation is hopefully more complex. So these are the five questions. And uh, you see that two of these questions raise a demarcation problem. We have the, the, the second question, which is about the demarcation between mathematics and philosophy. And we have the third question, which is about the demarcation between uh, philosophy, uh, between uh, logic and mathematics. And uh, I remember also that Eric Schlieser spontaneously associated the demarcation problems with his uh, synthetic philosophy. Again, it's because uh, if you are doing philosophy of culture, you are dealing with the heterogeneity of regions of culture, then it's uh, very often you have to determine what separates two regions of culture, which is a, de a demarcation problem. Regions of culture for you is what would be the equivalent to symbolic form. So, you know, I'm, when I'm going to tell the story of philosophy of culture, I'm going to take the Cassiero was one big step of philosophy of culture, for sure. But then, uh, I, so. Does culture necessarily have like heterogeneity inside it? That, well, I think. Like you the, can't have a culture if you have only one region. So no, yes, uh, you, 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 can, you can think of culture as a. a mono region? Mono region, okay. mono, mono culture in a way. Uh, uh, it's possible. But, but you uh, couldn't have a philosophy of that culture because philosophy of culture is uh, no, so I, th I, think, I think there are some attempts in the history of philosophy which are of the kind described. Okay. okay. Comparative, right? Mm -hmm. Comparative. Uh, uh, no, comparative no, they, said, they, you know, comparative they, they include all regions in, in a general framework uh -huh. which makes regions More not universe. really heterogeneous. I think Hegel, for example, is a kind of uh, is, is, is is on your side. I don't have a side. <laughs> no. Okay. Perhaps, I think what but for, but well, how can this we, may be discussed. How can but, we answer but, her question if we don't? Well, I mean, you can think of header. It seems to me Jean Michel is heading for wanting to think of philosophy or culture as studying the heterogeneity. Yeah, right. Of culture, but you can also think that the job of philosophy of culture is to find the abstraction. That tells you how they're not heterogeneous. They are, in fact, all instances of some. They all have to count as a. They all have some common abstraction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's a very different program than what. Yeah. What I'm hearing Jean Michel talking. Yeah. To, uh, Interesting. I, 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 it's, I completely agree with uh, what Drew just said. Uh, but uh, then I started by saying that uh, philosophy of culture means uh, trying to reach a philosophical understanding of a heterogeneity of culture. So in my approach, heterogeneity of culture is obvious. Okay. Uh, but And I think that most of us feel that way. Uh, mm -hmm. we, we don't see art as the same as science, and, uh, and, for example. And we don't see both of them as the same as religion or as law. Okay. Classical examples. All, 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 all of these four examples are completely classical. In, for everybody who dealt ever with philosophy of culture. So I, I think there is an obviousness which, and I, I'm, I'm a bit suspicious with people who think that they are going to reduce this heterogeneity. But then I, I agree that uh, in a sense, you cannot do philosophy of culture without also doing the job of defining culture in general. Yeah, but then how do you define in general if you have an, an analysis of the particular so abstract region and you analyze that particular 
then, and then again, we have apparently there is a little bit of an interesting <coughs> question, right? How to do this? Yeah, well, right. so uh, I, I, I would recognize that there is a tension between the necessity of defining culture for doing this job, because it's part of work if, if you are dealing with the heterogeneity, we are, you are not in one region. You are in every region in a way. You are looking at every region. So you, you have to find a way of considering every region as such. So uh, in that sense, you, you need to look for uh, a general notion of culture. And so, so uh, but then the, the idea of philosophy of culture, as I understand it, but it was not the case for everyone who addressed philosophy of culture. As I understand it, it would be uh, achieve, uh, uh, managing to define culture in a general way while uh, respecting heterogeneity. That's the goal. But it's, it's, it's very difficult as I see it. So, um, so in, in the 2022 seminar, I tried to show that uh, the way we uh, deal with each of the five questions is always related to the issue of the border between object and sense. Uh, so in, the, in, the, in this new seminar, I'm going to deal only with the first question, the question about the status of the mathematical object, which appears to me by far the, domini the dominating one in the contemporary philosophy of mathematics. That's the issue everyone has something to say about. And I will do that, do that by describing three typical philosophical attitudes with, with respect to mathematical object. And here you see, I'm not going to claim that one of these attitude is right and the two others are wrong. Uh, that's because again, uh, as a non-analytic philosopher, for me, philosophy is not about deciding propositions. So uh, I don't want to have uh, to reach the right answer to the mathematical object is so and so. Uh, so for me, the, these three philosophical attitudes with respect to the mathem mathematical object, they are all good in a way. I understand them as all answering to a profound need to a profound rational uh, demand. Uh, but I, I don't want to decide between them. So, uh, uh, here, here is uh, it's, it's the last slide. Now I'm, I'm, I'm beginning the. So, I, I have to share screen again. <laughs> I tried to open my file. Is it, does it work? I, uh, I, 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 I think maybe it worked. Yes, it works. But uh, no, it, didn't. It, it didn't? Ah, okay. Ah, okay. I have it. So I'm, I'm, I'm beginning with this, the first attitude, which is seeing the object as child of truth. Oh, sorry, it goes too quick. So my, the first attitude, as I see it, is uh, looking at the mathematical object as child of truth. So the object is derived from truth in a way. And I think that such attitude is uh, often adopted, willingly adopted by analytic philosophers of mathematics. Even if I, I know that there is no necessity here, you, you may find analytic philosophers of mathematics who are not seeing the mathematical object as child of truth. And uh, I, I, I'm going to try to show you that Spinoza is a possible forerunner for this attitude. Uh, so what does it mean? It means that mathematical objects appear as induced by mathematical truths. And the idea is that we inhabit originally these mathematical truths. So we don't assert mathematical truths because we have mathematical objects and speak about them in a conform way. We rather introduce objects which are indicated by our truths. 
the introduction check that are indicated by our yeah we introduce the objects resting on some truths can you give an example yeah, i'm, go I'm sure. going to so to be an object is to be the reference yeah, yeah. of the term in a true state I'm 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 going to say 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 more about that. So uh, the starting point is the feeling that we rest on mathematical truth. Uh, mathematical truth is given. Maybe it is given historically, and it gives rise to a shared certainty. And uh, some people are going to say that uh, philosophers of mathematics cannot avoid that because they have to account for the excellence of mathematical truth. That's the job of philosophy of mathematics according to them. So uh, they cannot question such truth. It would be already derailed the mission. Hence, as philosophers of mathematics, they would say we have to feel we inhabit mathematical truth. So, if we, if we inhabit mathematical truth, if we already have truth, true mathematical propositions, then uh, we obtain objects as a reference for nominal clauses intervening inside which statements recognized as true. So here I'm giving you a quote from Bob Hale, which seems to say exactly that. For if certain expressions function as singular terms in various true extensional contexts, there can be no further question but that those expressions have reference. And since, since there are singular terms, refer to objects. The underlying thought is that from a semantic point of view, a singular term is just an expression whose function is to effect reference to an object and that an extensional statement containing such terms cannot be true unless those terms successfully discharge their referential, their referential function. Provided then, as certainly appears to be the case, there are true extensional statements so featuring numerical singular terms, there are objects, numbers, to which they make reference. So I Did think... Is exactly. Yeah. Now, now, there is a discussion about that. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm going to mention it. But so we find this declaration at the beginning of a book presenting the neologicist approach, a book by Bob Hale and Crispin Hart together. They want to vindicate Frege in the project of introducing natural numbers only with the resource of second order logic. So that's why it's called neologicism, because it vindicates Frege's logicism. Uh, the project of uh, Hale and Wright enfolds several components. At the most technical level, what we have to do is to recover the axioms of Piano's second order theory of arithmetic, PA2, within Frege arithmetic, FA. But there are a lot of other difficulties which stand at the philosophical level. One has to show, and that's what they try to do in the book, that the Hume principle is enough for defining a natural number concept. And in, in the book, The Reasons Proper Study, Hale and Wright discuss very carefully, carefully and cautiously every possible objection. Well, what is the Hume principle? It's the principle who says that uh, if we, we have two concepts which are equinumerical, equinumerical, so there is an equipotence relation between their extensions, then uh, they have the same number of elements. But uh, this is not the question to be discussed. Of course. Uh, you, 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 I, I think you are not agree. I think if, if you want to discuss, you have to wait a little bit still. No, but you are saying that they try to justify it. No, the, the, yeah. the, the justification is, is does it provide us with a correct concept of natural number? That's the discussion. And they, have a, they consider a lot of objections. Uh, so, uh, 
I'm not going to follow them in their impressive and subtle attempt at justifying their approach. Uh, uh, my point is, is rather that there is an underlying decision, is, which is to derive the object from the truth. And it's not the only time such decision has been made. I think it's, it's a typically important orientation of analytic contemporary philosophy of analytics. And uh, th this decision of deriving the object from the truth goes against a more traditional conception. Uh, uh, according to the traditional conception, we cannot speak about truth before objects are given. Uh, it's sure that uh, goes against a phenomenological approach, uh, and, and more generally a post-Kantian approach, but even I would say that the idea of the object has to be given first before the truth may be assessed. It's, it's something which is shared by, by the whole of what is called modern philosophy. And people could come back to Locke here. So I'm going first to describe the traditional approach a bit. Uh, the traditional. Can I ask for? Yes. Is this because in this modern approach, one thinks of truth as something you can only ascribe to properties or relations between objects? Yes. So one has to have the objects in order to even discuss truth. Yes. Is that is that essentially that's okay. exactly that? Right. Right. So, for example, the uh, the group with three elements uh, from which truth is it derived. Uh, yeah, no, that, that's not my attitude. <laughs> yeah, 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 I just wanted to but I, uh, But I think yeah. that uh, uh, a neologicist would say that you have the natural numbers, and then on the basis of that, you find a way to justify uh, how you reach such entities as a Z over 3Z. Right. Yeah, we. We have the natural numbers, which, which are given by their approach. And then there is this complication, which leads to all the objects we consider in ZFC. And you have to do a certain philosophical job to justify this, these new objects, which are built on the basis of the natural natural. Numbers. Okay. So, uh, so the, tra the, the traditional view uh, thinks that we, if we have mathematical truths, it's because we are able to say correct things about mathematical objects. So uh, as, as you said uh, exactly, Drew, we ascribe them properties that they indeed have. And in some sense, we may verify that they have the properties. I think that's the traditional view. And, uh, so in this view, derivation from objects from truth is excluded for metaphysical reasons, because truth presupposes objects of which it is the truth. Mm -hmm. So people like Cantor or Husserl speak about the way objects are given to us. So they work at providing an acceptable understanding of our ability to tell the truth about such objects taking into account how they are given, given to us. So their approach of the issue of truth is that if we come back to the way the objects are given to us, we are going to understand how we may be tell such and such truths about them. So uh, they, they, they try to understand truth on the basis of our access to objects, if not of objects themselves. That's a way of dealing with the foundational issue. I think this way, this traditional way, has both a quality and a fault, a pro and a con. The quality, the pro, is that uh, we, we, we don't avoid or neglect what I would call a manners problem. Because someone who is entering mathematics he may ask to get introduced to the objects about which the discourse will be. 
he, he, he may ask to get acquainted, acquainted to the items entering configurations that they will have to determine. To determine. So to say it in, in, in another way, when a subject is recruited as a mathematician, she's entitled to ask objects about which the investigation bears to be presented to her. It's a bit like in a social event, one may require that people they don't know and are going to interact with get introduced to them. So I think the phenomenological approach doesn't neglect this manners problem. Uh, what is the fault of this attitude? Uh, our acquaintance with objects seems to have to be formulated in phenomenological terms. Well, well, when I present objects, I refer to a way these objects are familiar to someone. And uh, the way objects are familiar to us is that they are aimed at in us by our faculties, one would say. Kant and say by our faculties. So they are aimed at in such and such manner. That's how we know that they are familiar. And uh, th this, this, this way of making uh, objects acquainted, uh, of creating acquaintance with objects is not acceptable for the new analytic mind because it is stained by the sin of indirection. Uh, when we say only of something that we aim at it, this something is not anchored in the actual as such. So it doesn't provide our discourse with a reference for that reason. The aim that is not ontologically determined, it's only psychologically determined. Hence the great criticism of psychologism. Psychologism is any way to uh, stage objects uh, not as real. So now I come back to Frege and Russell. And uh, it's sure that uh, for uh, Hale and Wright, uh, their way of defining natural numbers is Fregean. And so uh, it's uh, to, to take the object as deriving from mathematical truth or logical truth in that case uh, is Fregean. Sure, sure, for them it is clearly that way. But then the issue is disputable because we see when we read uh, Hale and Wright's book, we, 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 we are informed that Boulos or Demet, who are also Fregans, they disagree with that. They, they don't think that uh, the object can really be derived from any truth. So uh, uh, then, the point is that Frege did not assume personally the neologist gesture. Uh, they, re they, re they, re they remind us in the book of uh, Wright and Hale that uh, when Frege uh, considered this possibility of deriving the natural number from the Hume, Hume's principle, uh, they, Frege uh, introduces what is called as Caesar's problem which is a way to say that uh, it doesn't work. Uh, this definition is not enough to give us uh, proper acquaintance with natural numbers. So we cannot distinguish them from uh, concrete objects, for example. Uh, Can you speak a little louder now? It's me getting old. You are almost uh, non hearable. Sorry. 
We cannot hear you. I just speak up. Incredible. I have I know. no problem. We're asking Marco to speak louder. Can you believe <laughs> it? I'm going to mark this occasion. Uh, oh, no. okay. No. <laughs> no, the second problem, if I understand well, is the following problem. You have a definition of a, we have a condition tank for the number of concepts, but it is not enough to know what the number of concepts are. So it is not enough for us to say whether this is or is not a number. But it is, it don't seem, and I see the problem, problem has been discussed, etc., etc. But I do not see why present this problem <laughs> the same as deny that object exists insofar as they are the reference of steps in state. So I do not see why to present the same problem be the same as so, dismiss or the theological conception of I don't say that far that much. Uh, I simply say that the Caesar's problem, if you look at all the problems which are discussed in uh, Hales and uh, Hale and Mike's book, all these problems are we does the Hume principle, is the Hume principle enough to give us a real acquaintance with the truth no. All of that, for example, the, the, impre not. the impredicativity argument, uh, which is raised by uh, Damet. The, 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 not the way in which I understand the book is based on the assumption of the fact that the principle is enough. The problem is the way that the quantity is logic is this is the problem. But the fact that if you think this last true comprehension, we can do that on action is a that's, that's the technical part. That's what I said. But th there is also the philosophical part which takes more the most the part of the part book. whether you bring support is analytic. I think, I think in, in, in most cases it is not discussed in that way. Either by the, by, the, by the opponents or by the Halen Wright in the way they answer. They try to convince us that in a way it is enough for connecting us with numbers, the human principle. They, they say it in, in many ways. For example, you, you have, he, they explain that uh, uh, we can solve the Caesar's no, problem. Example, they explain that, that they explain that in predicativity is not a problem. Not a problem they explain whether... that uh, we, we, we are not transgressing, transgressing uh, Frege's conception of sense uh, because uh, the human principle recalls in, in the but left hand side a, the, 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 the content of the right hand side. So that, uh, I think all, all, all of this impressive efforts to answer the objections are a, a, a way to uh, convince us that uh, we are we get acquainted to the natural numbers by Hume's principle which which is in a way di difficult to assume because it is supposed to be ground to, to be grounding for the natural numbers so to course it depends what you mean to be acquainted by if to be appointed by is to prove a kind of action, is no. If to be appointed by is to prove the existence of numbers, then this is a different question. It's neither of them. Is. Something that is not innocent. If to be appointed by means to really have epistemic access, it ought to be intrinsically mean to be the natural number, so you are rich. You are, uh, Right, there is also a battle of argument that I to show that is the good way of access to natural number. But if to have access to natural number is simply to prepare an action, it's Yeah, but that's not the point. Yes. It's very clear for me that in the book they are considering resist, uh, resistances which are not detected. So, uh, so I, I quoted, I mentioned you a lot, but I think we don't read that the same way. I'm not surprised in a way. <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, so uh, we may broaden the discussion because we, we may try to know if it is coherent 
with Frege in general to derive reference from truth. And uh, I, I think that it's difficult to answer that. In a way, in Frege, everything starts with a claim of reference, which stands in our shared language, which means that for Frege, no one has the power to suspend this uh, reference. And I, I remind you how it goes in Frege. When, uh, Frege simply says, when I claim that the moon is smaller than the earth, I don't claim that my representation of the moon is smaller than my representation of the earth. Had I meant that, I would have uttered it. So for, for Frege, our designating phrases, that's the way I understand it, count for us as picking a reference outside language, whatever we could say against it. So traditional philosophy was thinking that it's up to us philosophically to decide whether we have the objects or not. And uh, according to Frege, he says that in our language, we cannot uh, resign from uh, using uh, nominal clauses in a referential way. So we, the decision is already made. That's the point of Frege. And which decision? The decision for reference. The, his, his argument against traditional philosophy is that it's not up to our philosophy to decide whether there are external objects or not. I can't think as a external object, I think an abstract object. So, of course, the argument about the fact that the object exists for the truth is an abstract object, not the moon. The moon exists by like that, it's a concrete object. Yeah, that is, there is no discussion. The question is whether the approach to the moon also extends to abstract object numbers. Yeah. This is what Frege denies. So, okay. You, you may say whatever you want, but I, I'm saying something else. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So I, I'm, I'm simply saying that the strength of Frege's argument was that he, he shows us that the decisions of reference is already taken at the level of our shared, shared language. So what does he say about propositions? Because this issue about deriving the object from the truth, it's, it's mostly it's about the relation between nominal clauses and propositions. So. Uh, when, when he deals with propositions, uh, he, he also says that we cannot resign from their claim to say the truth. We cannot take language as not uh, pretending to say the truth, uh, because the meaning of a proposition is co coincides for us with the declaration about the world they are. When, when we say P, it means as much as, as it is true that P. Uh, so uh, both Frege argues in a coherent way that on the one side, our nominal clauses cannot but refer and our proposition cannot but pretend to be true. And uh, also we know that in uh, the famous Sinn und Bedeutung paper, he connects the claim to reference with the pretension concerning truth because he observes that we care about reference exactly when we try and verify our declarations. Mm. So ultimately, and already, uh, especially in Sinn und Bedeutung, as we know, Frege, Frege, Frege conceives truth as a new kind of reference. All true sentences refer to metaphysical true, and uh, all false sentences refer to metaphysical false. Uh, and it should be also reminded that uh, Frege adds to that the principle of context, according to which sub-expressions of sentences only mean what they mean in the context of a sentence of which they are part. So th th this is a, com a complex and strong picture, but I think uh, he, he, Frege doesn't overtly sustain that objects get introduced into reality as soon as some designators participate a true sentence. This formula of objects as child of truth, as children of truth, 
we don't you don't find it in 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 the general philosophy of language of Frege, but he underlines the truth reference correlation, and he gives priority to the propositional level. So you can say, if 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 we have meaning priority of the propositional level, then we could have also ontological priority of the propositional level, and then uh, existence of objects could be derived from uh, truth of propositions. You can go that, but it's not the way you find in Frege. So there is a, a discussion of strong Tyler Birch, you know? yeah. So I don't know that, but, but I'm, I can, I'm, I can send the user. I'm, I'm sure that this this issue has been uh, very often. I'm sure the issue has been very often discussed very often because discussed. it's, it's so a, you are taking a position, very. Uh, yeah, I well know. Uh, uh, but that I mean, that's not my position. So no, no reason for of course, because it's not no, mine. But, but that's another story. I, I, I remind you that I described this attitude as one of the possible attitudes. I am not joke of the second one. What is <laughs> what I'm not joking is your position is a factor. I come to Russell. So uh, I think we find in Russell, in philosophy of logical atomism, an ontological take similar as the one of Bob Hale. Uh, because in, in, this, uh, in, in, in this series of uh, lectures, we, we, you know, uh, Russell conducts an inquiry about the fundamental structure of reality. And for him, it's also uh, an epistemological inquiry about the conditions of our knowledge. And he, he retains the basic cell, cell of the world as uh, atomic facts. The world is made as atomic facts corresponding to atomic propositions. So uh, a bit of context, uh, Russell say, says that we cannot avoid recognizing atomic facts as the basic components of our image of the world. And this protects us from holistic Hegelian vertigo. So I think both in Frege and in, and in Russell, you find a decision uh, because Frege says, things are decided in our shared language. And Russell says, if we don't make the good decisions, we are, we are going to be sold to Hegel. And he, he wants to save us from a holistic Hegelian vertigo. Because according to holistic Hegelian vertigo, uh, we cannot have any local description of anything because everything interferes with everything. So uh, it, it makes impossible to isolate a configuration and determine it. So uh, Russell uh, therefore concludes that we have atomic facts, which are the truth makers of atomic propositions. Atomic propositions are of the type R of T1 dots uh, Tn. And uh, he concludes that the Ti entering an, atom an atomic propositions refer to actual individuals around which atomic fact organizes itself. So it means that again in Russell, apparently uh, referent names work referentially because they participate a true proposition. Atomic facts are the truth makers of uh, atomic propositions. So atomic propositions are true and therefore the TI refer. 
Is that the order? Is that? Is that the order? It refers because they are part of the atomic of That's how I read it, but I, th I, I think I, I reread uh, Russell and uh, I, co I agree with you that uh, it's debatable because he's not extremely clear. But then I think it's at least one understanding which is strongly suggested. Uh, so I, so the, this idea of object as child of truth, you find it also in the famous uh, indispensability argument. Uh, attributed to Quine, but also to Patnam. Uh, as you know, the, the, this argument is grounded on a Quinean remark concerning ontological engagement. Uh, Quine observes that uh, it's not enough that we use names to prove that we are referring to in external indivi existent individuals, because we are able to speak about Sherlock Holmes or about a unicorn. So that we are using names is not enough. And, and Quine comes to the conclusion that it's at, 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 it's at the level of our quantifications that our take about what exists expresses itself. If I use A in my language, A may still be without denotation. So, Quine seems to uh, recognize that uh, we are using language, we, we are using a free logic. Our language. Uh, but if I commit to sentence exists, exists X such that X equal A, I give existence credit to A. Then here is Quine's reasoning. Uh, we take the discourse of physics as true to the world. Here is another decision, which is unavoidable for Quine. Uh, we cannot resign from scientific realism. So we, we cannot uh, take the discourse of physics uh, differently, but as true. So uh, in, in, in the discourse of physics, we know that physics quantify quite often over mathematical objects, speeds, frames, group representations, so on. So if we manage to show that such procedure is in, indispensable to physics, we are allowed to conclude that mathematical entities are part of the realist picture given by physics. So, in, in this argument, it is extremely clear, according to me, that mathematical objects are derived from the truth of physics. So it's again a case of objects as, child of, as children of truth. So I don't claim that all analytic conceptions of mathematics share this decision, this attitude. One should pay attention to each case. Uh, one should try to assess Zalta's strange Platonism of abstract objects. One should assess Hartray Field's vision of concrete mathematics or Shapiro's structuralism. I think probably some of these conceptions resist being aligned to the general form of object as child of truth. Uh, I'm not going to deal with the issue. Uh, but I want to say a bit more about a well-known argument which is often used in analytic philosophy in order to offer a global picture of analytic philosophy of mathematics. And here I'm thinking of Ben Aserraf's dilemma. Uh, first, uh, at first sight, one could say that in the paper where he formulates his dilemma, Benasseraf ben seems to acknowledge the priority of objects. He, he, he describes philosophy of mathematics, as we know, as trapped between two reefs. Uh, we cannot but wish to interpret mathematical truth in a classical way, which means in conformity with the correspondence scheme. But then the difficulty is that if we admit of mathematical, mathematical objects, uh, oh, so, sorry, 
So we have, uh, we have to construe the two statements of our mathematical theories as declaring in a conform way the relations happening to objects having been determined before these theories independently of them. So, and there is a difficulty with that, which is well known, which is that it seems to be mandatory to conceive the mathematical object as devoid of place and of date. So, uh, because uh, mathematical objects lack of any special or temporal coordinates, they cannot be concrete objects. Hence, hence they have to be abstract objects. But uh, then we don't understand how we draw informations about them and how we finally state some truth about them because they don't interact causally with us. Uh, so our sound judgments about these objects are mysterious. So uh, in the paper, it's quite explicit that Benasaraf seeks for a naturalized epistemology. Uh, he, he, he wants to explain mathematical cognition in a naturalist way. Uh, for example, it's straightforward for him that our performance of referring to actual individuals results from the causal action of these individuals on us, more generally than, math than for mathematical objects. So Benasra's dilemma, the dilemma against has great strength, and it was very impressive on a lot of scholars. Uh, I make here so, some simple ob observations. I think that uh, normally, if, you, if we follow uh, logical task and semantics, the truth of the statement gets computed on the basis of supposedly known reference of involved terms as well on the basis of the extension attributed to relational predicates. So if we have a, a predicate of arity N, we assign uh, the, its extension has to be a set of N, N uples. Uh, it's sure that you can read Tarski's seminal paper differently uh, by insisting on a, uh, the part played by the meta language of the theory of truth, and then uh, truth would not be exact computed on the on, on the basis of reference in the same way, even if the definition given is meant to portray that kind of verification. Uh, we have to remember that in the beginning of the paper, Tarski uh, claims fidelity to the traditional notion of truth as correspondence. So that would be the normal way to see truth as computed from reference. Uh, but uh, and, and very clearly, if, if, if we do as Bob Hay suggests, we are allowed to do, uh, if, if we determine the object as implicit in the truth, in the truth of the proposition, we invert the direction of any purported verification. We behave as if verification had already happened and a reference could be deduced from it. Uh, but uh, how does Benasseraf behave with respect of this debate? Uh, I think that he clearly says that we start from mathematical truth and we would like to recover the classical interpretation of this mathematical truth. So he, he also starts from mathematical truth. And his conclusion that mathematical objects have to be abstract is derived from mathematical truth. We know in advance that mathematical truth is not circumstantial, that it doesn't depend on what happens to be the case. So Ben Asraf also starts from mathematical truth, I think. Uh, Okay. 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 Okay.
compass, because we are the independent through the structure of anarchism. That is the point of the From the state and the scientists, the state to be there too, because they are, they are logical. So we do not need the object. So we can conclude that also exist because they were more statements that they are true and they cannot be true because they are logic. But of course, this argument does not apply in the other case in which we have no independent source of truth. It's clear. So this is the point of the mu. Only we are not an independent source of truth. So we do not exist in order to say that. Is smaller than the different, but the case apply particularly so subject in particular but only when we have an independent source of truth. No, I understand that. But it's you you say it differently. Sorry, you say it differently, but it's the same. You, so truth is not always the same. Sorry. So, so it means that truth is not always the same. Truth is not always. So no, no, okay. I mean, in, a, in a way, I have nothing against it, but uh, just I want to I, I want to make this difference clear. So, uh, so we uh, what you reminded us is very important is that uh, what is behind any logicism, be it, be it uh, the one of Frege or the one of the logicist, is that we inhabit truth with logic. But this is. This yes, is logic is a, a, a difficult question. In any case, we have an independent source. Beautiful. Yeah, well, but, uh, uh, so that, that's my, my, my general idea is that if we proceed in that way, we have to inhabit truth. So, uh, so uh, as I just said, I think that in Benasaraf, even if the Benasaraf's dilemma seems to introduce the issue of the object and to give it some priority, uh, in the last sentence, when you read Binasaraf, you understand that he also starts from truth, and he was he wants to recover truth as classical. Jean Michel, you remember the title of the paper of Binasaraf where he presented the What is uh, remind me? Mathematical. Okay. <laughs> so no, uh, he, he wants to make it classical, and so uh, his whole reasoning is grounded on, on the fact that. We inhabit truth, uh, but then I, I think an obvious question: if one has uh, understood all the all these uh, occurrences of uh, the object deriving from truth in uh, analytic contemporary philosophy, uh, we could ask about the origin in the philosophical tradition of this option. Uh, where does it come from? This idea that we inhabit truth, and uh, so it's, it it comes with the idea that verification is is second as an operation. What do we mean by inhabit truth? We have mathematical truth. We share it. It's our home. So, so for we we're more naturally at home. Of truth and objects. I'm trying to understand yeah. it too. I don't yeah. know what it means to be at home. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it means that uh, the uh, mathematical truth we have, we leave it. And uh, uh, mathematical objects, we are going to define them. And we are going to find them. We are going to uh, define our access to them. That, that's that's the okay. so uh, and so and uh, so my claim is that I'm, and that's what I'm going to uh, to expound in, in the next session is that there is a Spinozist origin this attitude in in, mm. in, in Spinoza you find the same mm. and then I'm going to offer. Uh, Formal contemporary uh, analog analog of Spinoza. This idea of inhabiting truth it can't mean that we're incapable of false beliefs, right? No, no, no. It, it doesn't mean that. You're right. It's it's it's, it's a difficulty with the 
we have truth and we, we are able to protect truth from uh, wrongness. I think the problem here perhaps is this weirdness of this idea. It's too metaphorical. We cannot give a meaning to it. It comes from a tradition that it's, you know, there's, there's, a, there's an entire philosophical vocabulary way of things, things here that is ingrained in this metaphor. I think it's very natural for us to be uncomfortable with this. Even I myself, that I feel kind of more familiar with that other tradition, I don't know how to explain this idea that we inhabit truth, except if I understand, if I then put things in an art frame, which is the frame that objects are things, and truth is a it's a propositional phenomena, and propositions and objects are different things. So I can only understand that we inhabit truth if I understand that we inhabit a world that is propositionally structured when we describe this world somehow and objects are things with which we make propositions and of course i am a wittgensteinian i'm sorry i could not mention it but that's the point you know i think i see a difference between truth as a propositional phenomenon as something that applies to things we say about the world and objects are the things with which we put things together and then talk, you know, in the world. We say things also about propositions. We say because, and then of course we can say that propositions are also objects and then we have meta language, right? I so, uh, as I hear you, this doesn't mean that, Gisela, that, that we can talk about propositions, doesn't mean that you take, we inhabit, are not different we, we inhabit truth as a kind, as describing a performance. Absolutely. Uh, it's it, it's not a performance. It's, it's the idea that uh, we start from mathematical truth and then we reach the object. But we start when, where, when we are students, no, because, when we are researchers, because, when we are Because what? mathematical truth is given to us by history. I think it's the only answer. We have mathematics. Well, truths. when you are teaching mathematic, mathematics to kids at school, you are teaching mathematical no, truths I, I, to them, I, I, aren't I, I, you? I'm not speaking. I, 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 I just explained what, what, what do we mean when we say that we inhabit truth. It's a very interesting claim. I don't know whether it's true or false, but it's a mathematical truth is given by history. I don't know. That means that the mathematical truth is given by history and that the form of the proofs of the theory and of the form of the acceptation. Well, then comes the discussion. Do you, you, is it? So you, there is something that, so this is an internal notion of true and external notion of but given by history, it seems to be given by the fact of mathematics. So, what, what is no, the truth? What, 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 why what I described is, is a lot it's of true because it, it has been proved, it's been accepted along the history. Is that you want to say or no, not? Because no, it is no. what you want to say, I agree with you. No, no. Uh, no. If it's not that, that's why you don't understand it. No, I was just trying to say just, that it's very I, was, I, I think that there are, you, you have two two ways of seeing that, uh, mathematical truth. Either you think that mathematical truth is contingent on objects which are outside, outside your mathematical exercise, and then sometimes you say correct things about these objects, sometimes you say non-correct things. So uh, you, you are not inhabiting truth. Uh, it, it, truth is only your, your uh, performance in some cases. Or oh, then you, you have the idea that uh, there is at least part of mathematical truth which we inhabit, which is uncontested. Uh, we cannot contest it in any way. I, I, I don't agree with it. Simply, I am not calling the truth. And so, uh, and, so and then, and then, and then, then you derive the objects from that. I thought I agree with you. So that's that's thought, that's thought, the thought, idea thought, of we I inhabit truth. truth. It is not the word analytical philosophy. Truth, is, truth is not something which uh, contingently a proposition manages to accomplish with respect to objects. Uh, come from truth. Uh, objects come from truth. Okay. But that, I got that, truth. That, that's I got the truth. picture. I, that, that's what I have. Uh, I have tried. I have tried to grasp in contemporary analytic uh, philosophy of mathematics, uh, and that's admission. what is in in Spinoza. If you if you take the task and attitude. No, but perhaps we can give and more can meaning truth, to the metaphor when you present it to Spinoza, and we can have like more substance to the metaphor yeah, yeah, well, to Hopefully. Yes. <laughs> truth is a quality of a proposition of describing the actual world. This is truth. It's a property that a proposition could have when it describes the actual world. But if this is true, so this is the usual conception of truth, we cannot inhabit truth because of this history. 
Yeah, because I think we are. But if we accept the idea that we inhabit true because of history, that is an idea that is totally accepted. So we can tell that, but it is not the truth in the usual sense of the term truth. I think there's no usual sense. Uh, um, the uh, Jean Michel, if, if, if you want to go to it, to. Yes, I think, I think it's time now. Yeah. Okay.